Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the 10X Genomics 4th Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, press star 0. Thank you. I would now like to hand the call over to your speaker today, Ms. Cassie Corno, Investor Relations and Strategic Finance. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Earlier today, 10X Genomics released financial results for the fourth quarter and year ended December 31st, 2020. If you have not received this news release, or if you would like to be added to the company's distribution list, please send an email to investors at 10xgenomics.com. An archived webcast of this call will be available on the investor tab of the company's website, 10xgenomics.com, for at least 45 days following this call. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that management will make statements during this call that are forward-looking statements within the meaning of federal securities laws. These statements involve material risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results or events to materially differ from those anticipated, and you should not place undue reliance on forward-looking statements. Additional information regarding these risks, uncertainties, and factors that could cause results to differ appears in the press release 10X Genomics issued today, and in the documents and reports filed by 10X Genomics from time to time with the Securities and Exchange Commission. 10X Genomics disclaims any intention or obligation to update or revise any financial projections or forward-looking statements, whether because of new information, future events, or otherwise. Joining the call today are Serge Saxonov, our CEO and co-founder, and Justin McInear, our Chief Financial Officer. In addition, Brad Crutchfield, our Chief Commercial Officer, will be available for Q&A. With that, I will now turn the call over to Serge. Thanks, Cassie. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our call to review our fourth quarter and 2020 results. During today's call, I will provide a brief summary of our fourth quarter and full year results. Next, I will discuss the opportunities that lay ahead and how we're focusing our efforts across our three technology platforms to build great products that deliver amazing insights for our customers. I will then turn the call over to Justin for a more detailed look at our financials, including our outlook for the year. I would like to start by thanking our employees for their hard work and dedication through an extraordinarily difficult year. 2020 brought significant challenges, change, and sacrifice, but I continue to be impressed by and grateful for our team's resilience and commitment to our customers and to each other. Despite all the challenges, we made important progress across our business in 2020. To start, total revenue grew 22% over the prior year to $299 million. In the fourth quarter, revenue grew 49% over the prior year as our business continued to recover from the impacts of COVID. We grew our installed base by 45%, selling 746 additional instruments. We continue to expand our customer reach and our products have now been adopted by all of the top 100 research institutions and top 20 pharmaceutical companies. Our customers published more than 1,500 peer-reviewed papers, bringing the total to over 2,200, more than doubling the number of total publications over the course of the year. And we continue to invest in developing and defending our patent portfolio and added more than 300 new patents and patent applications, expanding our coverage of enabling technologies. We now have more than 1,000 patents and patent applications. We also reached important operational milestones. At the onset of the pandemic, we acted quickly to implement a number of protocols and safety measures to ensure the health and safety of our team members who needed to remain on site to support essential operations. This included creating a program to provide recurring SARS-CoV-2 testing on-site for all employees at our headquarters. As an additional safeguard, we made use of special powered respirators, which filter out particles and aerosols with very high effectiveness. We supplied this equipment to our employees who needed to work on-site 
in close proximity to each other. These and other safety measures have facilitated the safe return to work of most of our research and development, manufacturing, and other operations personnel. With these measures in place, we're able to continue onboarding new customers, shipping products, building out infrastructure, including the implementation of a new ERP system, and executing on an incredibly ambitious product roadmap that we laid out at the beginning of the year. We launched four new products for our customers. This started with our targeted gene expression solution, which allows researchers to target the genes most relevant to their research, validate their hypotheses faster, and reduce sequencing costs. Second, our single cell multi ohm attack plus gene expression solution, which allows researchers to read both gene expression and epigenetic programming in the same cells across thousands to tens of thousands of cells in a single experiment. Third, our Visium spatial gene expression solution with immunofluorescence, which allows whole transcriptome spatial analysis and protein detection in the same tissue section. And finally, a new version of our single cell immune profiling solution offers increased sensitivity, reduced sequencing costs, and access to rare gene signatures. Reflective of the excitement for these new products, our single cell multi ohm attack plus gene expression solution and our Visium spatial gene expression solution were named as two of the top 10 life sciences innovations of 2020 by the Scientist Magazine. We also significantly expanded our global operations. In the fourth quarter, we opened our Singapore Manufacturing and Distribution Center, which was done completely virtually. We will use the center as a hub to support our growing sales in APAC through improvements in our global supply chain and our customer service across the region. We believe these investments will be critical to support our long-term plans to scale the company. We made two key acquisitions in Reedcore and Cartana, which together with our early stage initial research and development efforts are forming the foundation of our third product platform in the emerging in situ field. Developing products in this field has been on our strategic roadmap for some time. These two acquisitions were made with that overarching strategy in mind and should help us deliver incredible new capabilities to our customers. With these acquisitions, we gained important technologies, enabling IP, and added amazingly talented people. Our team is the foundation of our company, and they are ultimately the source of all of our success. Throughout the year, we added more than 250 employees, the vast majority of which were onboarded virtually. Over 70 of these hires were in our commercial organization bringing our total to 290 commercial employees at year end. I'm so proud of the brilliant, passionate, and hardworking individuals who continue to be drawn to our mission at 10X. And as always, we're intensely motivated by our customers' work, by their discoveries, and by their progress. Last year, the COVID pandemic presented an unexpected and acute challenge to the scientific community. Many of our customers responded with great determination to understand this disease and to develop ways of fighting it. As an example, I'd like to highlight two major papers published in just the last few weeks. The first, published in Nature, came from the University of California, San Francisco, where researchers used single cell sequencing to compare mild and severe COVID patients. They discovered that patients with mild disease display a specific pattern of gene expression that coordinates the immune system's fight against the virus. In contrast, in severe disease, the patients are producing rogue antibodies that interfere with that pattern and with the proper functioning of the immune system. This points to targets for potential immune ther- immunotherapies in severe patients to re-engage viral defense. The second paper published in Cell came from the Single Cell Consortium for COVID-19 in China, made up of researchers from 36 institutes and hospitals. This group ran a massive study performing in-depth analysis on hundreds of samples from nearly 200 patients. They were able to link key changes across large numbers of different cell types to clinical features, including age, sex, severity, and disease stage. The study revealed multiple features of the immune response that were previously not appreciated. This dataset provides a rich resource for understanding the pathogenesis of COVID-19 
and for developing effective therapeutic strategies going forward. Now, while we're still navigating this pandemic, our customers have adapted to work with this new, within this new environment. We believe labs have reached a steady operating state, which will continue until the pandemic is brought under control. Demand for chromium instruments remains strong in the fourth quarter. Customer engagement drove pull through back to pre-COVID levels, and usage in biosafety labs continues to drive incremental instrument placements. Importantly, during the quarter, we booked our first multinational correlative biomarker study involving clinical samples from 12 collection sites. We're excited about the opportunity for using the Chromium platform to improve the yield of the drug development process. Turning to Visium, the platform continued to grow during the fourth quarter, and there have been more than 80 publications and preprints to date. We're highly encouraged by the pace of adoption and growing use cases. We believe these papers provide critical validation across a number of exciting areas of research and will accelerate market adoption in our existing markets, especially in translational settings. Previously, we have talked about Visium's applications in oncology and neuroscience. While these continue to be the major drivers of Visium adoption, we're also excited by the range of new use cases that our customers have been exploring. For example, Visium is being used in studies of heart biology to understand congenital heart conditions and atherosclerosis. There's a study to understand the progression of liver fibrosis to identify targeted, targetable pathways for antifibrotic therapies. And to better understand kidney disease, customers are using Visium to obtain spatial and temporal profiles of chronic kidney injury and compare them to those from the normal kidney. Now, even with our commercial success over the past several years, it is still very early days. Looking ahead to 2021, our investments are focused around four key priorities. First, building out our organizational and operational infrastructure. Second, driving broader chromium adoption. Third, establishing Visium as the standard for spatial genomics research. And finally, developing the in situ platform. Starting with our organization, we're strategically scaling our business to build ahead of demand and to drive future initiatives. As I mentioned earlier, we ended the year with close to 300 commercial employees, and we plan to hire at least 100 more throughout 2021 to support global expansion and new product launches. We're also making investments across the company in our global IT infrastructure, operations, R&D, and GNA. As a part of these investments, we have acquired land nearby to bring our sophisticated manufacturing capabilities closer to our R&D to support the rapid pace of product development. We're also hiring top talent across our company to grow every part of our organization with plans to increase our employee base by approximately 50% over the course of the year. As we scale, we're focused on preserving and nurturing a mission-driven culture that drives us to achieve things that have never been done before. These core values have been and will continue to be a critical part of our long-term success. Turning to Chromium, we remain very early in its adoption cycle and in the impact of a single cell revolution. Since its launch in 2016, the platform has quickly scaled to more than 2,400 instruments. And while impressive, it is still a very small fraction of our total opportunity. Our products are already starting to sweep away many of the conventional tools of standard biology. And they're doing this across all of the life sciences, across what are conventionally viewed as distinct market categories, whether it's molecular biology, cell biology, protein biology. And from the continuing interest we're seeing from new customers, it is clear that this is just the beginning. We expect that single cell approaches will become the standard for many types of biological experiments across tens of thousands of labs around the world. Our goal with Chromium is to keep driving broad adoption and expanding from early technologies and genomics leaders to the tens of thousands of biologists focused on answering specific biological questions. We're investing to remove barriers for those new to high content genomics and to keep increasing the utility for our more established users. We're accelerating customers along an adoption curve with new product configurations, allowing the total cost of experiment to be optimized across a wide range of Chromium use cases. 
The following capability is coming to the market this year. A cellplex kit launching in the first quarter that will enable cell multiplexing for large experiments, reducing the cost by as much as 60%. A low throughput kit also launching in the first quarter that will reduce startup costs for single cell experiments and enable efficient proof of concept studies before scaling. In the back half of 2021, we will launch a fixed RNA profiling kit to allow a fixation at point of tissue collection, unlocking access to large sample cohorts. And Chromium X, a new high throughput instrument that will enable routine experiments of 1 million cells. And finally, the 10X Cloud is now live for North American users to enable streamlined data ham- handling and computation. Moving on to Visium, this platform remains even earlier in its overall adoption and life cycle compared to Chromium. Visium is incredibly powerful for elucidating spatial biology and is the highest resolution spatial genomics product on the market. This platform has been on the market for less than five quarters, but has already gained broad adoption. We are now focused on establishing it as the standard for spatial genomics research and expanding its core capabilities in response to market demand. We're very excited about future product launches, starting with Visium FFP, which we expect to begin shipping in the second quarter of this year. The single biggest request for translational customers, in fact, the necessary condition for most of their research, is the compatibility with FFP samples. This is the predominant way that patient samples are collected and stored. It's the standard part of pathology workflows. We're launching a complete solution comprising all ready-to-use reagents and software, It is the first technology to enable true discovery in FFP samples, delivering the full transcriptome across the entire tissue. What's especially remarkable is that the sensitivity of this product is on par with what we see with analyzing fresh tissues with standard Visium. This performance exceeds even our aggressive internal expectations and is very exciting to our customers. In addition to FFP capabilities, a key request we have received from our Visium customers is to help with sample handling and logistics. Most importantly, our customers would like to analyze archive samples that have already been mounted on conventional non-Visium slides. To answer this need, in the first half of 2022, we plan to launch a new instrument called Site Assist. We expect that Site Assist will really simplify the workflow for many of our customers it will significantly expand the number of samples that could then be run on Visium. And finally, we expect to launch Visium HD in the first half of 2022 to deliver single cell resolution. Visium HD is based on big fundamental advances in the underlying microarray technology. It will come with a resolution that's 400 times higher than the current Visium and over 1500 times higher than the original pre-Visium technology. We believe that this, toge- that this, together with all the other investments we're making, will establish Visium as the single best platform for scientific discovery and translational research. We're at the very beginning of the Visium story. The enthusiasm from our initial customers and the pace, variety, and breadth of the early publications represent a significant opportunity for the Visium platform and spatial biology as a whole. To keep driving market adoption and help our translational customers make the most of the platform. We will expand our clinical translational network this year ahead of launching Visium FFP and highly multiplex protein assays. And finally, with the addition of in situ capabilities, we have added the foundation for a new platform that we expect will help us address another long-term growth vector. The promise of in situ is the ability to measure large numbers of molecules directly in their native state in tissue at subcellular resolution. This is different from chromium, visium, or most current analytical techniques where molecules are removed from tissue before measurement. We expect to build an integrated system which can be viewed as analogous to IHC or fish-based approaches commonly used in pathology but scaled to vastly greater multiplex levels and information content. These capabilities lay the foundation for an ideal clinical instrument for tissue-based analysis. And as more insights and translational work gets done with Chromium and Visium, in situ will provide the natural format for many of these applications to be adopted in the clinic. In the long run, we expect that just just about every tissue will be analyzed using at least one of these three approaches, 
whether for basic science research or for medical applications. Moving beyond 2021, let me discuss our view on the market opportunity. We previously outlined our near-term opportunity within the research tools market as those areas where people are looking to do high throughput research. This currently represents approximately $15 billion of the more than $60 billion global life science research tools market. As more research moves to the high resolution, large scale approaches, more of the total life science research tools market will become available to us over time. In addition, there will eventually be many powerful clinical applications based on single cell and spatial analysis of tissues. We expect our in situ platform will be well positioned to bring many of those applications to the clinic. If we make modest assumptions around the numbers of potential samples and pricing, we estimate the size of this opportunity is around an additional $10 billion. Perhaps the greatest revelation in biology over the past several years is the pervasive cellular complexity that underlies just about every biological system. It turns out that every tissue harbors much greater diversity of cells and cell types than we had previously thought all of them interacting with each other in a complex interplay of massive gene expression networks. Going forward, it is clear to us that in the future, the vast majority of biological tissue samples will need to be analyzed with single cell context at large scale and at high resolution. And we have been investing in three core platforms that together will enable precisely this future for our customers as they write their stories of the century of biology. And looking ahead in 2021 now, we expect our revenues to grow more than 60% over 2020. Overall, I could not be more proud of our team for their execution this past year. Their talent, expertise, and hard work has laid a strong foundation for long-term growth. With that, I will now turn the call over to Justin for more details on our financials. Thank you, Serge. Total revenue for the three months ended December 31st, 2020 was $112.2 million compared to $75.3 million for the prior year period, representing a 49% increase. Similar to prior years, our revenue in 2020 was more heavily weighted to the back half of the year, particularly Q4, due to the typical budgetary cycles of our customer base. In addition, there was a concentration of orders during the month of December as more labs opened up and customers resumed experiments. Consumables revenue was $96.5 million, which increased 49% over the prior year period. Instrument revenue was $14 million, which increased 49% over the prior year period. Service revenue was $1.7 million, which increased 48% over the prior year period. North America revenue for the fourth quarter was $57 million, representing 34% growth over the prior year period. EMEA revenue for the fourth quarter was $32.9 million, representing 54% growth over the prior year period. APAC revenue for the fourth quarter was $22.3 million, representing 95% growth over the prior year period. Gross profit for the fourth quarter of 2020 was $93.3 million compared to a gross profit of $58.7 million for the prior year period. Gross margin for the fourth quarter was 83% compared to 78% for the fourth quarter of 2019. The gross margin increase was driven primarily by favorable product mix due to the next gem transition, which did not carry the same level of royalty accruals as legacy gem products. As the transition to next-gen products is now substantially complete, we see this level of gross margin as a high point and expect that future quarters will have a slightly lower gross margin as our newly introduced products expand to become a larger percentage of our overall revenue. Total operating expenses for the fourth quarter of 2020 were $502.9 million compared to $66.8 million for the fourth quarter of 2019. Our fourth quarter operating expenses included $406.9 million of in-process R&D expense due to the acquisition of ReadCore. R&D expenses for the fourth quarter of 2020 were $39.7 million 
compared to $27.9 million for the fourth quarter of 2019, excluding in-process R&D expenses related to the acquisitions. The increase was primarily attributable to increased personnel-related costs. SG&A expenses for the fourth quarter were $56 million compared to $38.8 million for the fourth quarter of 2019. The increase was primarily due to increased personnel-related costs. Operating loss for the fourth quarter was $409.6 million compared to a loss of $8.1 million for the fourth quarter of 2019. This includes $14.3 million of stock-based compensation for the fourth quarter of 2020 compared to $5.1 million for the fourth quarter of 2019. Net loss for the period was $415.6 million compared to a net loss of $7.1 million for the fourth quarter of 2019. Now turning to our full year results. Total revenue for the full year ended December 31st, 2020 was $298.8 million compared to $245.9 million for 2019, representing a 22% increase. Consumables revenue was $252.7 million, an increase of 22% over the prior year. Instrument revenue was $40.1 million, an increase of 15% over the prior year. Service revenue was $6 million, an increase of 48% over the prior year. As of year end, we have sold a cumulative total of 2,412 chromium instruments, up 746 instruments from 1,666 instruments at the end of 2019, which represents a 45% increase in the ending install base. Our customers have historically averaged approximately $150,000 a year in consumable orders per instrument, outside of the impact of the pandemic. Q4 was above that rate on an annualized basis, but due to COVID impacts earlier in the year, our 2020 pull-through averaged $124,000 per instrument for the full year. North America revenue for the full year was $159.3 million, representing 14% growth over the prior year. EMEA revenue for the full year was $73.3 million, representing 26% growth over the prior year. APAC revenue for the full year was $66.2 million, representing 38% growth over the prior year. Gross profit for 2020 was $240.4 million, compared to a gross profit of $184.9 million for 2019. Gross margin for 2020 was 80%, compared to 75% for 2019. The increase in gross margin was driven primarily by lower accrued royalties related to ongoing litigation, partially offset by higher costs from newly introduced products. Total operating expenses for 2020 were $774.5 million compared to $215.4 million for 2019, inclusive of $447.5 million of in-process R&D expenses related to the acquisitions of Cartana and ReedCorp. R&D expenses for 2020 were $123.4 million compared to $83.1 million for 2019, excluding $447.5 million of in-process R&D expenses related to the acquisitions of Cartana and ReedCorp. The increase was primarily attributable to increased personnel and stock-based compensation expenses. s expenses for 2020 were $202.3 million compared to $130.8 million for the prior year. The increase was primarily due to increased personnel and stock-based compensation expenses and increased litigation expenses. Operating loss for 2020 was $534.1 million compared to a loss of $30.6 million for 2019. Net loss for 2020 was $542.7 million compared to a net loss of $31.3 million for 2019. We ended 2020 with $664 million in cash and cash equivalents. Now turning to our outlook for 2021, we expect full year revenue for 2021 to be in the range of $480 million to $500 million, representing growth of 61% 
to 67% over full year 2020. As in prior years, we expect revenue to be heavily weighted towards the back half of 2021, particularly in the fourth quarter. We ended Q4 with about 90% of customer labs operational at varying degrees of capacity and are still seeing a wide range of efficiencies within the COVID operating environment. Going forward, we expect this capacity to fluctuate in the near term and we view the percent of labs open as a less important metric compared to the available capacity per lab. We don't expect much improvement in lab capacity in Q1, and Q1 will also lack the seasonality benefit of Q4. As a result, we expect our Q1 revenues will be sequentially down from Q4. While the most visible impact of COVID-19 on our business has been customer lab closures and reduced capacity, we are also managing supply chain and logistics risks. These have not caused significant disruptions to date, but our customers are subject to similar risks, which could limit our customers' ability to perform experiments. It's an ever-evolving situation that we are tracking closely. As we enable the century of biology, we will continue to aggressively scale the company. In 2021, we are focusing our investments on R&D, to continue our rapid pace of product development and innovation, intellectual property to protect our products and scientific advancements, our commercial organization to continue to build our sales and support teams and adequately address the interest we are seeing from the biopharma and translational markets. And finally, on our operational capabilities to ensure we have a solid foundation to enable our future growth. At this point, I'll turn it back to Serge. Thanks, Justin. I'm so proud of our team and of our achievements in what turned out to be an incredibly challenging 2020. While the pandemic is not over, we anticipate that it will be brought under an increasing measure of control as we progress through the year. Next week, we're hosting an inaugural virtual event called Experience, where we will share details about the work of our customers and upcoming products. I look forward to seeing you all there. Overall, there are many reasons to be optimistic as we look to the coming years and beyond. The pandemic brought into a sharp relief the need to accelerate the mastery of biology and the importance of our mission. And looking beyond the current pandemic, advances in the life sciences are poised to transform the world in massive ways. We anticipate vast long-term opportunities ahead of us and intend to keep scaling the company and investing aggressively to capitalize on them. With that, we will now open it up for questions. Operator. All right, so as a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. To resolve your question, press the pound key. Please limit yourself to only one question and one follow-up question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Dog Chantel from Cohen. You are now live. Uh, hey, good afternoon, uh, guys. Um, I'm actually in the office, but on my cell phone. Hopefully the reception is okay. Um, 10X has always been a company that's done a fantastic job balancing high gross margins, uh, which is, of course, attractive to investors, with innovation that makes new technologies accessible via ease of use, quality, and, and oftentimes reduced price per unit for the customers. I'm recognizing that you noted in your prepared remarks that you're close to a high water mark with gross margin. As you roll out newer products with often lower price points and add new products organically and inorganically, how do you think about the longer term outlook for maintaining gross margin at levels seen over the past few quarters, meaning at least in the mid seventies or so, you know, even as we factor in, you know, what you said about, you know, this being kind of a, a high water mark quarter. Hi, Doug. This is Justin. I'll take that one. Uh, you know, our high consumables gross margin is a core strength of our business model, and it helps enable the deep investments that we're making to develop new products. Uh, in our product development process, we typically target gross margins of about 80%. Uh, some of our newer products have lower gross margins than our previously existing products, but they're mostly in that range. Uh, so I think 80% is a good number to think about for the near to midterm. And uh, what you've proposed, I don't think is unreasonable to think about in the, in the longer term. 
Okay. Thanks for that, Justin. And I, I, th- I think this is another one for you. Um, I believe you talked about $150,000 in consumables per box, you know, on an annualized basis as the assumption that you baked into guidance. You know, on the surface, that seems a little low to me. I mean, back in Q4 of 19, you generated 165,000 in annualized consumable pull through. Um, you know, I think that the full year number was a little bit lower than that, but still north of 150,000. Um, I point to those numbers because obviously 2019 was pre pandemic. And I, I recognize on one hand, Q4 is seasonally a strong consumable quarter, you know, as we look back to Q4 of that year. But on the other hand, you you have a higher mix of higher pull-through chromium connects out there, and you also have more Visium users out there, which, of course, you know, because we don't have a great way of modeling it, you know, that those consumables revenue typically get baked into that number. Um, So it's just not clear that your 2021 revenue guidance embeds an assumption that, um, you know, that that is kind of consistent with what we've seen trend-wise absent COVID and what we've seen, um, you know, in terms of, increased Visium adoption. Can can you just kind of walk us through what I might be missing here as I think about it as, you know, that, that number looks a little bit low? Yeah, it's a good question, Doug. Um, I think starting at the, at the beginning around uh, Q4 and seasonality. So Q4 is seasonally quite a bit stronger in total than the other three quarters. Uh, and you're right that the Q4-19 pull-through was a uh, was a large quarter over quarter uh, increase from the previous quarters. And in fact, uh, Q3 19 was well below the 150,000 per year. So that's why we focus on annual pull through and uh, not quarterly pull through. For our 2021 guidance, uh, we contemplate uh, existing customers continuing to increase their usage while we're adding a large number of new customers at the same time. And those new customers take some time to ramp. We've previously said that around 150,000 or slightly above that is a good pull through number to use as we balance um, the increasing utilization of existing customers against this ramp up of the new placements. And as far as the connect goes, uh, that's, you know, that is having some impact on the ASP. When we look at the ASP between the Chromium controller and the Chromium connect, but that's a, a, a niche product and it's very, early on, and so that isn't making a material difference in our average pull-through as of yet. All right. Thanks again, Justin. Thanks, Doug. Next one on the queue is Tycho Peterson from J.P. Morgan. You are now live. Hi, good afternoon. This is Julia on for Tyco. Thanks for taking the question. Um, so staying on the pull-through question, um, I know you know that at our conference that, you know, some of your oldest customers are at $1 million annual pull-through, and you also have Visium FFP and Site Assist coming to unlock sample volumes. But at the same time, you know, as you add new customers, they also weigh on throughput, at least initially. So um, I know you said, you know, 150K as, you know, a good number for 2021. But as we look longer term, what do you say is the pull-through potential of Chromium uh, in the out years? Are you still thinking about uh, 200K by 2023, which is, I, I believe, a, a data point you previously provided? Or do you now think there's significant upside to that? Oh, this is... This is Justin. I'll take that. I'll take that one as well. Uh, you know, it, it's a great question. There, there's a number of factors that are going to contribute to that. Um, you know, as we're adding an, an ever increasing number of new customers each year and introducing new products uh, like Visium, the new capabilities on Visium, the Chromium Connect, uh, the Chromium X, uh, it's going to take some time for those products to uh, to ramp up and. Uh, for us to see how they actualize in reference to our uh, expectations. Um, but, you know, the thing that I think is remarkable is that our pull-through has maintained, you know, outside of the impact of the pandemic, but, you know, has maintained itself in that, you know, high 140 to, you know, 150 range, uh, even as we've, you know, like this year, increased the instrument install base by, you know, over 40%. Um, so, I think it's um, it's yet to be seen how that pull through metric will materialize. 150,000 is the best uh, estimate that we can that we can give you right now for the near to medium term. 
Um, but at some point, the focus is going to be just on overall consumable application spend within the three platforms that we've defined. Got it. Um, and then separately, regarding the Salesforce expansion, you mentioned you're hiring at least 100 more salespeople uh, throughout this year. How should we think about the pace of that hiring and the cadence of revenue ramp um, this year? And then um, what's the relative resource allocation between single cell versus spatial or between academic versus biopharma customers, if that's a better way to think about it? Um, and then are there any, you know, geographic focus? Uh, you previously noted China is a big opportunity, and now with the Singapore manufacturing, you know, how significant will China be um, as, a, you know, as a relative, you know, um, mix of your total revenue? So one of, this is Brad. Why don't I start on the, at least the Salesforce side, and then Justin can take the rest. But um, in general, we're trying to hire those people as prudently and fast as possible. So, you know, typically in a sales organization, you want to sort of front load it. Um, growing so much and we're adding so many people. Um, and we're also really having to make up for the fact that we had a little bit of a pause as we were trying to understand the, 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 the course of the pandemic and what it would ultimately impact uh, our business. So in general, we will add um, at least 100 people uh, this year uh, expanding pretty much across the organization, but you, you call out China is a real opportunity for us. And there we continue to add commercial partners as well as our own team members so that we have a very good view of what's going on in China. And overall, China is going to be a major growth axis. It is, as you already saw in the fourth quarter numbers, and it's been this way for the last couple of years and will continue to be that way, a major, major growth axis for us. I think that covered it, Brad. Did, did was there any more to that, Jill? Um, the, the the resource allocation between academic and biopharma customers. <clears throat> well, I, maybe I mean, I'll just touch on that. I mean, we we are building out a focused strategic account sales force to deal with pharma and biotech, but mostly pharma and large pharma on their validation side of the, the house. In other words, outside of the discovery realm, which we certainly can handle. So in that sense, we're, we're building a lot more uh, capacity and, and even internal capabilities to understand and really provide the right kinds of products and documentation that's needed to say that translational into the drug discovery validation process. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Next question comes from Taya Seven from Morgan Stanley. You are now live. Hey guys, um, good evening and thanks for the time here today. Um, I'll start with one on, on, on Chromium um, for you perhaps, Serge. Uh, you know, you've got the, the Connect launch underway. The Chromium X, I believe, comes with a $100,000 ASP launching in the back half of the year. Um, um, so how do you think about upside to that 50 to 55K range instrument ASP? I mean, should we be thinking of closer to uh, sort of 60K come year end? And then in terms of distinguishing the value proposition, um, you're spoken about sort of walk-away automation as being the defining um, sort of feature on the Connect, and then you've got, you know, the high-throughput PopSeq users as a target for, for Chromium X. Um, how are you thinking about sort of reinforcing that messaging with your customers, and then have you had any early discussions with your PopSeq uh, sort of potential user base just yet following the launch announcement uh, in January? Uh Thanks, Deja. So I'll uh, I'll start with that. The the, the questions focused on uh, the X. Uh, so we certainly have been talking to customers. I would emphasize that it's not just sort of the pop seek um, uh, application that uh, X is uh, aimed at. In fact, probably mostly at other things. Uh, and there's there's plenty of applications like um, uh, uh, like immune profiling, like looking at. Uh, uh, scaling up atlasing efforts, looking at more cells, uh, combinatorial drug screens, combinatorial CRISPR screens. This is where, m like, some of the most intense kind of demand is coming from. Um, so, um, and so we certainly have been talking to customers about these, and uh, there, I think there is, uh, there is, that, that was the interest that motivated the development of the instrument in the first place, and we have. Uh, if anything, have been grown more excited by the potential and what we're hearing from customers. Um, so I think that's 
That's the Chromium X. Uh, in terms of uh, Connect, I mean, it's the same uh, story. I mean, uh, Justin alluded to this before, but the you know, walk-away automation has been the uh, the rationale for the Connect um, and specific uh, biopharma customers. But again, during COVID, there's a, like an expanded use of a uh, set of cases that have emerged around, uh, you know, because people are constrained around when they can actually be in the lab, when they can run things. So uh, the Chromium Connect has the advantages that are uh, that are particularly um, relevant now. Uh, so that's kind of that's how these are the instruments are evolving. I'll let Justin touch on the ASP part of it. Yeah, so for the Chromium for the Chromium X, the pricing uh, isn't isn't final yet. And uh, as far as the ASP range goes, fifty to fifty-five thousand is what we've talked about in the past for uh, uh, for Chromium. Uh, the average ASP, including Chromium and Chromium Connect, uh, for 2020 is still in that fifty to fifty-five range. I would say in light of the, you know, what we would expect to sell in Q4 of this year, um, you know, with the legacy instruments, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend making any adjustments uh, to that until, until we get closer. Um, got it. That's helpful. Um, and then, um, Serge, uh, any color to share on new versus repeat customers in the quarter for Visium? I know in the last quarter you'd highlighted repeat orders as, as a key sort of uh, customer constituency where you saw strong performance. Yeah, a good question. I think that trend has continued. Um, again, our focus internally and what we're seeing from customers is, is really that, is their reorder rate and getting the the customers through their workflows to their uh, the answers, and you see that again reflected in the increasing number of publications, uh, preprints that are coming out. Uh, so overall, I think it is trending positive, and it is the kind of the important area of focus for us now that we've established like a nice initial user base. Got it. Perfect. And then one final one for Justin here. Um, in light of your comments, Justin, around sort of this 50% increase in headcount, um, should we be sort of just extrapolating from that to um, to sort of, you know, 120 million per quarter sort of OPEX run rate with a 40-60 R&D versus SG&A split? Is, is, is the math sort of right um, at a high level on that? Or, or could it be, you know, um, sort of similar but more front-end loaded, more back-end loaded through the year? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, it's a good good question. Um, you know, we we are planning to to grow headcount by, you know, fifty percent this year. Most of the hires are going to be in R and D, uh, followed by commercial, and then G and A and or operations in G and A. After that, um, I would more heavily weight it towards the front half of uh, towards the front half of the year, and more heavily weight it towards R and D. Perfect. Super helpful. Thanks, guys. Next one online is Derek De Bruin from Bank of America. You are now live. Hey, good uh, good afternoon. So a couple of questions. So can we talk about the new multiplex application? I mean, you you say it sort of saves customers sixty percent in cost. How is that sixty percent? Is that sixty percent on sequencing cost? Is that sixty percent on you on uh, to you? And basically, the question is it's like. You know, do, are you expecting just the higher volume experiments to make up, you know, any sort of potential price erosion on your end? Yep. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. It's an important question that we thought a lot about. So, um, the, we, this is an average estimate for like what we expect customers who are using it to save, uh, inclusive, like overall uh, on their experiments. Um, it is definitely the case where they will end up spending less per sample, their expectation, and it's borne out by um, uh, by what we have seen of customers doing, um, uh, using kind of homegrown, homebrew solution previous, solutions previously, is that this will lead to more usage overall and more dollars flowing into the single, single cell experiments in total. So, um, so the, the, the sort of the drop per sample, um, uh, Cost in the, in the reduced cost per sample will should materialize in higher overall spend. Uh, maybe not right immediately, but certainly over time. Got it. And can you talk a little bit about the forward monthly order growth rate? Um, I mean, you, you you provided on the last couple of calls um, just some clarity on what just some color on what you're sort of seeing. Um, Derek, this is Justin. So, you know, in the in the past couple quarters, I think in the in the 
in the midst of COVID um, without guidance in place, uh, we were trying our best to give to give color on what we were seeing in, in real time. Uh, but now that we've now that we've reinstated guidance and we've um, given some color around uh, the waiting as far as, you know, mostly in the back half of the year and particularly in, in Q4, um, uh, we, we won't be giving any kind of uh, mid quarter uh, update, at least at this time. Fair enough. Um, just thought I would ask. And finally, one last question. Um, can you talk a little bit about how much of how much you have embedded into your your current guidance for recent new product launches in 2021? Um, just some sort of sense of of what's additive. Is there any sort of cannibalization that could happen? Um, so just some general thoughts on on how you're thinking about new products contributing to the top line. Yeah, so the, so the guidance, the 480 to 500 range, uh, incorporates all of the new product launches. Um, you know, it, it's our, it's our best view taking into account those different factors that you mentioned, like cannibalization, uh, how we expect those products, uh, what we expect the adoption curve to look like based upon what we've learned on, on past launches, but it's all incorporated, uh, in that range that we've given. Great. Thank you. Next one on the queue is David Westenberg from Guggenheim Securities. You are now live. Yeah, um, thank you for taking the question. So um, on, in terms of the, the new product launch in the low throughput area, how should we think about the, the transition speed um, of your customers in terms of dabbling their cell, uh, dabbling in their toes into single cell to full um, believers uh, of single cell? And, 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 you know, how should we think about the impact of, of that low throughput kit, uh, kit on that transition speed, just based on uh, you know your early customer experiences. Hey David, this is Brad. I'll take that. Um, as we've not launched the kit right now, we really don't know, but we, we we do think we have a very good kind of view of the two reasons that this kit's important. One, as you've already pointed out, is it gives people an opportunity that are new to 10x to try and do sort of pilot studies. And those usually can be used to help gain grants and funding, and in some cases, even a, a budget allocation within a laboratory. The other side of it for us is, is and this is where I, I'm cautiously optimistic this could be very important, is giving customers that are more experienced customers a test bed to test uh, experimental workflow, work out sample prep procedures, uh, all the all the you know the time courses of the way they they harvest samples, all of that can be worked out in a very a much more lower cost environment to measure the the you know the, the likelihood of success of an experiment. So those are really the the two things that will drive that. I mean, probably. And then so your question is how quickly if we take that first group of people, you know, we're we're hoping that we can run people through that adoption cycle certainly within a year. Um, typically, when we have, we have a lot of experience launching products, we, we, we launch a lot of them, and ultimately just understanding adoption cycle. But in this case, it's just it's kind of a new use case, and just understanding how that models out. Um, we'll keep an eye on it, but as we launch that product, which will be in the next few months. Got it. Now that was uh, very helpful. And then in terms of, um, are you giving any kind of uh, number in terms of percent of? of your um, Visium customers that are, sorry, percent of Chromium customers that have, have um, are starting to use Visium. And then just in terms of um, are you seeing a pickup in Chromium when you see uh, customers pick up Visium? And, you know, how much do you think that is actually on account of Visium versus just these are high users of genomics platforms, period? And uh, that's my last question. Well, uh, so maybe I'll start here. I, I will say this, that uh, you have to appreciate that the Chromium is a pretty, uh, has now a large established user base, and especially the number of customers uh, is actually larger than just the number of uh, instruments because of the kind of the concept of Halo users around each instrument. So, um, you know, the, and then if you look, just looking at the map, the number of uh, Visium customers, a very large fraction of them are existing Chromium. Uh, users as well. So, you know, the fraction of uh, um, of Chromium people who are using Visium is, 
not trivial, but it's also not very large, right? That's how the math works out. Um, I would say as far as the, it being a driver, I'm not sure if that's that's material right now. Probably on the margin, there is some sort of uh, some additional chromium usage that might happen or uh, vice versa, but I don't think that's the sort of the cross reinforcement is that material at this stage. Thank you. Next one on the queue is Dan Arias from Stifo. You are now live. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Thanks. Uh, Serge, maybe just on a few of the new products and, and thinking about the, the range of capabilities that you're kind of looking to enable here with the X instrument but then also the lower throughput kits. Are you able to give us sort of a, a rough cut on the customer base just in terms of, you know, how many or what percentage want to look at 10,000 cells at a time versus 100,000 versus a million? I know that's probably hard, but it would just be helpful to understand the buckets a bit, if possible, when we just think about who these products are targeting at this point and, and how many of them will really be helped once they have access to them. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And like you said, it's a hard number to pin down. Um, and in fact, it's a moving number to pin down. If you went back just a few years ago, the, the number of people interested in 1 million cell experiments would have been you know, essentially zero, maybe one or two in the world. It certainly has increased now, like uh, you know, re referencing the applications I mentioned earlier, immune profiling, combinatorial screens, especially with the rise of sort of CRISPR screening applications that has been Significant. So I would say, yeah, you know, that number of people who are at the cutting edge uh, and would be interested in, you know, many hundreds, thousands of cells or million is, uh, it, it exists. It's not huge, but it's not trivial either, right? Uh, and we expect that uh, kind of looking at the pattern of single cell usage and the scaling up of the last five years, we we anticipate that people will keep moving up that that year, and we certainly will help them along as well. Okay, um, and then maybe just on the, the fixed RNA profiling kit that's coming later this year, is the idea to launch targeted and whole transcriptome at the same time, or will one be in the market before the other? And then I guess relatedly, will they both be launched at some point this year? Thanks. So uh, the question specifically for a fixed RNA profiling kit? Yeah, um, please. Yeah, so we haven't uh, talked about the details of, uh, of, of on that cadence. It's a good question, but we haven't talked about those details yet. Okay, thanks. Next one on queue is Patrick Donnelly from City. You are now live. Hey, thanks for taking the questions, guys. Um, Justin, maybe just on the full year guide, can you just talk through, I guess, the assumptions you've made on the end market recovery? You know, certainly exited 4Q in a good position. Yeah, I guess when are you thinking we get back to, to kind of normal state? And, and maybe for Brad on the back of that, you know, obviously you saw a nice budget flush, as you guys mentioned, at the end of 4Q. Yeah, have you seen any slowdown, I guess, in January as you kind of, as that spend kind of played out? Was, was there kind of everyone taking a breath in January? Or did the strength kind of continue so far this year? Hey, Patrick. Uh, good good question. When we thought about guidance for for this year, you know, we, we really looked at the, the, the first half and, and, and the back half. And I think for the first half, you know, as, as we shared in detail, at least for, for Q1, uh, we really don't expect much improvement as far as the lab capacities go. And really, I think that's the case for, uh, for Q2 as well. Um, I think we're optimistic around the back half of the year, and that's why we talked around the, about the, the waiting in more the second half of the year, particularly Q4. Um, but this assumes that things will uh, start to turn around in Q3, but won't really be felt until Q4. Yeah, and Patrick, as far as the uh, start of the year, you know, typically, <laughs> the, you know, January is is is, is slow. Um, I think this year it was a little bit uh, larger because, I mean, let's face it, the, the the news in December was pretty dire, and we certainly saw some some headwinds as as case counts were spiking, and and again, sort of the doom and gloom was the, was the prevailing uh, um, feeling. Uh, we certainly have seen that improve in the last three or four weeks, um, three weeks probably. And, you know, ultimately there will, there's probably, and as Justin just described, there is some aspect of, of, of pull in and that's contemplated in our, our, our guidance. 
No, that's helpful. Um, and then just maybe on the FFP launch, you know, that's nearing, you know, maybe can you just talk through the potential customer conversations there? I mean, has there been a part of the market kind of holding off on adoption until this was available? Uh, I'm just curious what, what the conversations have been like around this uh, ahead of the launch. So on FFP, I mean, thanks. It is a it is a product that we've been uh, pretty excited by uh, for 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 some amount of time. I think uh, the feedback from customers and on what it uh, what it is able to do has been very positive, and we're very excited to get it to like a broad set um, and launch it um, you know um, fully to the market uh, later in the first in, in the first half of this year. So just, everything is looking good, and we're excited by it. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, I mean, the world didn't really get a good sense of how good this product's going to be just only maybe in the last uh, six weeks, and that's really sparked a lot of interest. Yeah, that's helpful. And maybe last one, just on the in-situ side, you know, obviously a big investment year more than more than certainly the revenue side, obviously, but you know, what has feedback been from customers since the deal, you know, just in terms of interest of using it, complementary with Visium, and then anything we can look out for as we progress through the year in terms of milestones, or is it kind of going to be uh, you know, behind the curtain and, and we'll see it in a couple of years? Well, uh, yeah, the, interesting question, right? Because the instru instrument has the in interest has certainly been there, just like you guys have been asking a lot of questions. But in CISO after the deal, customers have certainly been uh, very interested as well. For many, you know, similar reasons, there everyone is intrigued what we are going to be able to do. I think partially this speaks to our reputation. We've built great products before, so I think people are expecting big things from us. As far as um, going forward, uh, I mean, we are we're focused right now on developing the platform. There's a lot to do. This is a very challenging, uh, generally technology area to uh, to build products in, and we are investing to build to build awesome products for our customers. That's that's our focus right now. When we're further along, when we're um, we'll 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 talk about it. All right, appreciate it, Serge. Next one on the line is Matt Sykes from Goldman Sachs. You are now live. Thanks for taking my question. Um, just a, a more high-level question. I know we've talked a lot about the, the headcount increase you guys plan to do over the course of the year. I'm just curious more on the qualitative side. How competitive is that market, both on commercial and R&D, and has it gotten tighter over the course of the last year, and do you expect it to, to get tighter over the course of this year? So uh, yeah, it's a good question. So I'll ask. Um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll answer it broadly. The company and you know Brad might might be able to add more color on the commercial side and on sales side. Uh, so look, talent. Like I said during my opening remarks, talent is the kind of has been the focus for us from the very beginning. That's the foundation of the company. So always top of mind concern, and we're always uh, we're always trying to get the very best people in the company. So it, as far as we're concerned, it's always in some sense a tight market. Um, kind of regardless of what happens there. Right now, uh, it, you know, it varies by area. Uh, back in the early days, it was particularly more challenging for us, for example, to hire more like software developers uh, um, uh, in you know people out of the sort of tech industry. That has gotten relatively um, uh, easier for multiple reasons. Um, we, in general, I think we're doing. Um, especially compared to sort of startup days, uh, it has gotten easier and we're doing quite well and we're very happy with the level of talent that is uh, uh, that is coming to the company, very happy. And I'll just add a little bit on the, the uh, commercial side. I mean, there's generally been somewhat easier, like Serge said, overall, because people know who we are. Um, in a commercial, there's always that sort of uh, competitive aspect and people like to be part of a winning team and we try to make sure that 10x is a winning team so overall it's 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 improved but we also have a very high standard so the yield is not very high in getting people through the interview process great thanks for that color and just one last one I know you guys have talked about um, lab capacity. I'm just wondering, is, is, as you look out regionally uh, where you guys are, are there any differences in the cadence of capacity within labs um, across different regions, or is it pretty much the same cadence that you're expecting as we get towards the back half of the year, the capacity to go up? 
Yeah, uh, maybe I'll just take that. I, you know, we there's a complete range. I mean, in places like China, it's it's kind of back to what I would consider normal. And and in, even generally across Asia, we've seen that stabilize fairly quickly. Um, Europe is is with the exception of the UK has is continued to, to open up and function uh, at at a at an increasingly improved capacity. And in AMR, we see it, it, it's kind of a, all over the board. Uh, you know, early on in the quarter, uh, or let's say towards the end of the quarter, I should say, we saw certainly some issues in Southern California as there was a spike there. But overall, we've kind of reached that point where there is some level of attenuation, but we, we as I think Justin's pointed out, we're going to have to see the impact of the vaccine before we see any material change going forward. Great. So thanks very much for the call. I appreciate it. There are no further questions at this time. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now discuss.